Canada and the United Kingdom as well. Do we have any other countries represented other than what I've mentioned? No? All right, sounds good. They're the ones that I was sort of able to pick up through the registration. So it's great that we've got um, a global audience. Um, so I guess to begin with, um, just to start with an acknowledgement of country, and I think this might be a foreign concept for people um, in in because we do have an international audience. So if you're not from Australia, and perhaps it may be um, far on your side of the world, but an acknowledgement of country uh, is particularly key um, for us in Australia to acknowledge um, the fact that Australia um, as a continent, as a country, belongs to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, so I want to start by formally, formally acknowledging um, uh, this reality and where I am in particular is the land of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. I want to acknowledge and pay respects to the custodial owners of the land all across Australia um, and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and I also want to extend this to anyone of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background that may be with us today. I also acknowledge the fact that sovereignty never ceded in Australia and I stand in solidarity as an ally for the ongoing struggle for recognition. Um, I think given the consciousness around um, difference in race at the moment globally with what's going on with things like the Black Lives Matter movement um, that's happened all in all parts of the world, Australia included, it's particularly significant I think that we um, are conscious of where we are and also the historical connection to what we're talking about today um, to Australia's history and to, to many histories um, as well in, in other countries around the world. I'm going to introduce myself, but firstly, I will hand it over to Liz Ticanio to introduce herself. So both her and myself will be facilitating or presenting today's webinar. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so we both go by Elizabeth, as you can see um, for this presentation, I'll go by Liz. But um, it, I'm lucky enough to be a project officer for diversity focus. Um, I have degrees and a background in cultural anthropology, as well as um, research background in public health and a keen interest in human rights and gender gender-based violence prevention. I'm most recently completing my master's, um, doing a study on migrant women who've come to Australia, who've experienced female genital mutilation cutting and um, kind of the social, biopsychosocial dynamics of that. So um, bringing together all those different kind of um, facets and um, really enjoying um, being here today and bringing together all those parts in terms of cultural diversity and today unconscious bias. Oh, thank you, thanks for that. Yeah, Liz is a wealth of knowledge, so I'm really uh, I'm lucky to be working with her. Um, so it, as far as, um, I guess by way of introduction for myself, as you know, I'm also Elizabeth um, Lang, um, and I founded Diversity Focus three years ago, um, currently head um, the organization. So basically what we do, our focus is culture diversity, training, research, and consultancies across various topics of which domestic and family violence is one, as well as the um, options around uh, workplace diversity training. Unconscious bias, uh, also a huge part of what we do, and a topic that really cuts across um, pretty much every workshop that we have, I think, from the DV streams all the way to the um, streams around uh, diversity in business or in workplaces, etc. Um, I also have a, a huge passion for human rights and social justice and my background within that area broadly comes from having done um, sort of advocacy work, so looking, you know, doing international campaigns around human rights and then moving into also training and moving into um, research as well. Also currently doing research on domestic and family violence as part of a PhD thesis. So looking at what does domestic and family violence look like through a collectivist cultural lens. And that's a piece of work that I'm very passionate about. Um, aside from that, I think if I was to say more broadly, I'm very passionate about um, facilitating, um, I guess environments or opportunities where people who can just dialogue and talk. Cause I truly believe that any form of change that can happen 
And we've seen that throughout human history, every change that has happened, even in terms of mass changes globally, they've happened as a result of dialogue. And so I'm very passionate about hosting conversations and just opportunities for us to unpack some of the concepts that we'll be talking about today um, as a means to, um, I guess, learn, but also to be um, made aware and, 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 and to be able to create change in that way. So that's a little bit about me. You have to be there with both Liz and myself. We're sort of managing, because uh, in terms of the setup, we've got the, the slides, obviously, that you can see, but we've also got um, other pieces um, to the webinar, such as a chat box. So every now and then we'll be checking the chat box to see if sudden it's probably because we're looking at the chat box, which you can't see from your end. Um, so as far as the webinar and engagement, um, sort of housekeeping rules, I guess. Uh, so this webinar is recorded. It will be shared on our website and also other plat um, platforms as a resource. Uh, we do have live streaming on Facebook. Um, I think it should be running. It's the first time we've done it, so we'll find out. Um, but it will. it is being, um, I guess, publicized. But saying that, though, your responses or your questions always remain anonymous. So even if you ask a question, only Liz or myself can see it and we can respond to it, but we don't, like the, it doesn't record who's asking what. So there's a bit of, um, I guess, confidentiality there in terms of if, if you want to ask questions later on. If you do drop out, you simply dial back in using the same link that you use um, to come back in initially. And if that's okay with um, everybody, we would like to send out a short evaluation form just been, um, and also to, to hear from participants whether um, there are other areas for improvement or other um, topics that may be of interest, et cetera. Okay, so we'll start off with talking about some principles. Um, these are principles that guide the work um, that we do more generally, but they have direct relevance uh, to the webinar today. And I just, I guess these are concepts that are important in the rights framework. So um, I guess thinking in terms of um, the right to safety being a basic human right, the right to equality be, being a basic human right. So that's a, that's a principle that, that is um, foundational to what we're talking about today. Uh, another one is, which I've all mentioned earlier, is that dialogue is necessary to create um, positive individual and collective change. Um, and it's important, I guess, in being able to do that, that we are able to get into a space where we're comfortable being uncomfortable because that's where growth really happens. Um, also that some concepts um, that we may be talking about today can be confronting um, for people. Um, and I guess it's important that, we're, that we remember that we're, we're in a space of learning and hopefully um, you're able that is a little bit um, uncomfortable that you sit with that and you use that as, as an opportunity, I guess, to learn um, and to unpack maybe what might be going on in terms of your thinking, et cetera. Um, and lastly, it's this notion that diversity exists because of our collective uniqueness. Um, and to keep in mind this notion that we are all diverse in our various different ways um, as well. So that's an important principle to keep in mind. So they're just some basic, um, I guess, um, things to keep in the, in the back of your, of your mind as we, as we start. All right, so as far as the outcomes of the webinar, we're gonna start off with um, just unpacking some key concepts. Um, uh, these concepts are foundational to what we're talking about. Uh, then we'll go into what is unconscious bias and how is it formed. We'll look at the neuroscience behind unconscious bias. So how is it that we form biases? What aspects of the brain are responsible for the biases that we form and how does that actually happen over time? Uh, we'll look at the types of um, unconscious bias that exist and also um, have a chat about some strategies that you could use to maybe address or mitigate it. Uh, and lastly, I guess throughout, we'll be exploring the impact of unconscious bias on individuals and groups. Now, this is a one hour webinar, so you can imagine um, being a huge topic, there's much more to it than what we're able to present today but we do deliver a three hour online or face-to-face -face workshop on understanding and addressing unconscious bias. If that's of interest to anyone, 
uh, you can check out the website um, and there's more information there about the learning outcomes for the workshop in particular. I guess just to start off with, uh, it would be great to hear from participants uh, what expectations people may have or what are you hoping to get out of the webinar today? You can um, type into the chat box if you have particular things that you had in mind. Um, what was your motivation maybe for registering? Okay, so somebody said to uncover any unconscious bias I may have. Yeah, fantastic. Another person said understanding how to assess unconscious bias. Yeah. We'll definitely talk about um, I guess, ways in which to uncover if we do, but not if we, we all have biases, ways to uncover what biases we do have um, and some strategies that can, I guess, help you become more aware. Uh, somebody said, I would like to learn what bias I have and not, and not know and what, and what we can do. So what biases that you have that you're not conscious that you have them and what you can do about it. Fantastic. Anyone else before I moved on? One more, okay, somebody said, I would love some practical strategies for overcoming my own unconscious bias and to use in my parenting of my white children. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you for those responses. Okay, so we're gonna, um, these are some basic, we call them rules of engagement. Um, and I know this is a webinar, so there's a bit of, um, uh, I, I guess people aren't necessarily, you, you can't see each other, so that's one aspect. But I guess just uh, keeping in mind in terms of the notion of respect, um, and I guess we, where Liz and I are respectful in terms of how we engage with the topic and, and, and yourselves as participants, but also that we request the same of you. Um, the other thing is also to keep in mind, um, and I know I mentioned this earlier, but it's it's key um, to keep in mind that if you do, if if anything is uncomfortable, you feel the need to disconnect. Do so as you need to. Uh, we're not necessarily talking about anything that is well that we think is hugely distressing, or um, but you know sometimes discomforts, different things trigger different people. So if you feel the need to disconnect, by all means, do so and and come back as you see fit. Um, it is recorded also, so you can also, I guess, um, come back to the webinar later on. All right, so we'll start off with, um, I guess, an exploration uh, of some key concepts uh, because they do influence how bias is um, formed. So I'll hand it over to Liz. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so like she mentioned, I, I think we can just um, kick things off by kind of going through some underlying terms or components that make up different forms of bias. There's been a lot of terms, at least in the recent climate of things globally, and to really pick apart kind of what they mean and how they form what we term as bias. Um, the first one, it's um, the underlying layer, which would be beliefs. And these are our baseline ideas or assumptions that we hold to be true. And these are usually based on our past experiences, our past relationships, and how they impact our future um, experiences. So um, beliefs are not genetic, and that's really key, but they usually they stem from three sources. Um, our past personal experiences, from our upbringing to our adulthood, um, our acceptance or our rejection of cultural and societal norms, such as religion, which we'll talk about on the next slide as well. And then lastly, um, what other people say or tell us that we learn in school, for example, or through a mentor. Um, these beliefs, however, um, we're in a rap very rapidly changing world. You know, complexity is increasing every day, and they can at times be problematic when we do use this past information to make decisions about a future which may not always be the best way um, to support us as we try to meet our own needs. Um, furthermore, we often justify and defend our beliefs because we're trying to evaluate and seek evidence that supports um, our belief system, so our collection of beliefs. 
Um, this is really important and pertinent to today's world um, as pretty much, you know, you go on Facebook, anyone who has access to internet can, can essentially find information that supports their own beliefs or what, whatever they believe. Um, and it can be quite polarizing. Values then build upon beliefs, and, um, but they are not based necessarily on past information, but are more like universal concepts. For those of you who are married, for example, perhaps you went through some sort of premarital counseling where you were asked to write down what values do you hold important for yourself, and then maybe your partner, you know, you compare that. And they include things like happiness, wealth, career, success, family. Um, they're based on what is important to us. Um, beliefs can turn into values as um, a per person's commitment to that belief grows um, and they can change and grow as we also mature as adults. Um, and what is the takeaway for values that I'd like you all to get is that it's very important that the person are, is able to articulate their values in order to make clear, rational, and consistent decisions. So um, by being able to self-reflect on what values are important for them, they're then able to deem what actions they take, whether that be ethical or, uneth or unethical. Next, um, on top of values, and based um, upon values and beliefs, we have our attitudes, which are, our, are the daily micro-judgments we make about others. Um, attitudes are quick micro judgments um, and I highly recommend um, if any of you have ever read uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell as he really goes deeply into kind of how um, our attitudes and quick judgments as humans have evolved over time and how they can be positive and negative. On the positive side, you know, there's that term go with your gut and, um, you know, you, it's, you can avoid danger, whereas on the negative side, it can sometimes lead to stereotypes and biases, which is the whole point of today. Um, the takeaway there is that um, attitudes are not always internal. They can be influenced by outside factors, and these things can be like political correctness, peer pressure, a desire to please. They're um, especially um, influenced when these outside, outside flat factors um, are stronger than what the person um, feels themselves. So whether that person has not fully thought through or self-reflected on what their own values are, they can be more easily swayed. Um, this lack of self-awareness and uncertainty can often, um, unfortunately, lead in certain cases to irrational attitudes or the potential, again, for bias or undesirable behavior such as prejudice. Um, lastly, and then we'll move on to the next slide, are our actual behaviors. So how we act upon our values, um, what attitudes we have, and how does that translate into action? Um, this is now when you move attitudes, you know, a negative attitude about someone might be considered a prejudice, a behavior now becomes discrimination. So that's kind of a, um, a belief or value unjustified by society that's deemed unethical or incorrect. Um, and then how that now becomes discrimination. Um, an example of that, you know, a pretty strong example would be apartheid in South Africa, or even in the workplace where a person from a minority background might be getting unfair treatment. Um, these are the actions that, that we take. Um, it's also really important that I'd like to, to clarify that just that we are all raised, like Elizabeth had mentioned earlier, with our own biases, with our own prejudices, every person on earth, and that just because we have those prejudices doesn't necessarily mean that we act on them um, and or that we discriminate, but um, we'll go further into that when we discuss the differences between conscious versus unconscious bias. Um, next slide, please, Liz. <laughs> Can I just quickly check? Can everyone see um, Liz or Elizabeth Ticanio? Can everyone see her when she talks? Okay, cool. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so continue. This, 
This slide I'll just quickly go through, um, but these are other factors that kind of affect um, the biases right. we may have. So social norms are like our societal collective representations of what we deem as acceptable behavior. Um, our common values, our traditions, our cultures, um, and they shape our worldview. So this is a personal um, lens that we bring um, influenced again by our past upbringing, our, our values, our beliefs, and it's our broad perspective on life and kind of the universe and, and our assumptions about the world. Um, ethnocentrism is a very <laughs> anthropological term, um, but it, it's a type of worldview where one person um, sees their own culture or their way of life as um, the correct way or the natural way and sometimes judges other cultures. Um, I have two examples. So in a mild situation, you might have someone from the U.S. who travels to uh, China or, you know, a country in Asia where they use chopsticks and, and it has this firm belief that um, chopsticks are unnecessary because forks, knives, and spoons are the much more practical um, way to eat food. But they still accept the fact that in other countries they eat with chopsticks, for example. Um, a more extreme example of ethnocentrism is when groups of individuals see other cultures as wrong and they try to convert that group to their own ways of living. This can lead to, to really adverse outcomes such as war, genocide, or stolen generations, especially if the group is unwilling to unchange their way of living or accept living with others who may not share their same cultural norms. Um, ethnocentrism can be a source of pride you know we have nationalism we have pride in our in our cultures and our, the countries we come from but it can also lead to issues such as stereotyping which is the last point before i hand things back to liz elizabeth um, stereotyping are the oversimplified assumptions that we make about other groups um, these are like in the past these generalized character caricatures of other groups and they're dangerous because they can oftentimes lead to stereotype to sorry to racism and discrimination so these are kind of the underlying concepts i just wanted to kind of delineate them all for you so that you can get a better idea of um, where bias comes from and and how we build upon that throughout our lives so uh, next i think liz will start going more into what bias is as well as unconscious and conscious bias. Thank you for that. All right. So I'll just kick it off to under um, this image before I continue. Any thoughts on this image? All right, so when you look at the, um, when you look at the image, both women um, you could say they're both looking and judging each other through an ethnocentric lens. And to some degree, people often look at this and say they're, they're both kind of right when you think about it from their own perspectives. Um, and I think this really ties in with what Liz was talking about earlier in terms of how uh, perceptions about what is considered the norm are shaped by the context in which we grow up in. So the social norms that we are raised in influence the way that we see the world and then subsequently the judgments that we might make um, about others in our environment. Um, so we know that bias can be both conscious and unconscious. So today we're focusing more on unconscious bias. But if bias is conscious, then it's, I, I guess it's, it's implicit and it requires that there's some intent with that. So if somebody consciously chooses to work with one gender over another, for example, they are making conscious decisions. They have an intent to exclude um, one gender or the other, for example, or, um, or as opposed to somebody who may not necessarily have a preference for gender or necessarily care um, you know, about some of the ideas that people have around, around gender, for example. 
Uh, if somebody uh, in, in a similar situation makes a conscious decision to work with people of uh, a particular ethnic, uh, um, ethnic group and not others, then they're also making conscious decisions. So that is conscious bias and there's intent behind that. Unconscious is uh, some of the, I guess, informed by the underlying beliefs that we have and we're acting out of these, um, I guess, deeply held ideas, but we don't necessarily realize we're doing it. And that's what we're going to unpack um, in a little bit more detail um, shortly. All right, before I continue, actually, what I might do, I've got a, I've got a riddle that I'm going to read. And if you've, if you've heard this before, and if you know the answer, maybe refrain from saying anything and, and that allow others that maybe haven't heard it before to, to have a think about what the answer might be. All right, so the riddle goes, so it's a little story goes, a father and his son are involved in a horrific car crash and the man died at the scene. But when the child arrived at the hospital and was rushed into the operating theater, the surgeon pulled away and said, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. Why is that? What might be going on there? Could I read it again? Yeah, maybe read it one more time. I read it again. Sorry. Okay. Can I share on the screen? Okay. Um, okay. Somebody's heard it so they know the answer. All right. I'll just read it again. Someone said, please read it again. I'll read it a bit slower this time. Um, a father and his son are involved in a horrific car crash and the man died at the scene. But when the child arrived at the hospital and was rushed into the operating theater, the surgeon pulled away and said, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. Why is that? So any thoughts, just put them in the chat box. Just check the chat again. Yeah. All right, I'll share the thoughts. A few people have heard it before, some people haven't. Someone said, uncle is usually called a father. So maybe it's the boy's uncle, okay? Any other responses? Maybe it's father as in like a gay couple father. So he's got two dads. Okay. Any other thoughts? Another common one is also um, that the father situation is like a religious type of thing going on. So father being like a priest or a pastor or something. Okay. All right. So I've got somebody here who said the surgeon is the mother, which is correct. Has anyone heard this before? Well, for those of you that haven't, um, did you come to the consciousness that maybe the surgeon is the boy's mother? Yeah, yeah, someone said good. Yeah, it's it's I think it's it's an interesting story and it's a common one. And often when I've done it in workshops, people have usually um it's taken time because unconsciously it really brings to the fore people's assumption when I guess deeply held beliefs when they think of a surgeon. Um most people generally think, okay, if the father died at the scene, how is it that he's that there's <laughs> A male surgeon now operating and obviously consciously um, people don't necessarily believe that you know consciously people believe that regardless of gender anyone could be um, a surgeon but deeply held assumptions sort of highlight that 
uh, when it comes to certain maybe careers, we often attribute, we have um, gendered ideas um, around careers. And, 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 and I think that is the sneaky thing about um, bias, because I think the surgeon's dilemma is one good example. Um, but often for us, it's not until we're triggered by an experience that we sort of become aware that we have these biases. And that's why they're unconscious, right? So if I was to give you an example, the first time I did that, I struggled with, with that um, surgeon's dilemma as well. But also when I reflect a few years ago, I remember um, traveling with my husband and two children. We're traveling over East and um, we sat down and I heard a voice come over the, the speaker thing. Um, and it was a pilot welcoming the, the guests, right? On, onto the airplane. And consciously I know that the welcome always comes from the pilot. But because I heard a voice that I, to me sounded like a female voice, I didn't, I wasn't even aware and I sort of just switched off. And I wasn't consciously thinking, I don't want to listen. It just, it was just this automatic thing where I, I wasn't really listening or paying attention. And it was actually my husband who said, oh, we've got a female pilot today. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, you know, that the pilot always welcomes people. And I consciously, I know that, but because I heard a female voice, I unconsciously switched off and made an assumption that it was like the service department, which I was really ashamed of being, you know, a very, um, you know, strong feminist and, and a believer that women can do everything. Um, but I mean, that, that's just an example of how often our biases, they're deeply held and they're outside of our conscious awareness. And it's not until we're triggered by an experience, such as a surgeon's dilemma for some of you struggling with it for a while, or for myself, um, you know, the assumptions that I had that were deeply held that the pilot must have been uh, a male, for example. So it's not until we're confronted by these triggering experiences that we are able to then realize that we have these biases. So I'll move on to looking at what bias actually is. And what I'll ask is, oh, there's just a question in the box. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but I guess just to throw the question out to you guys, what, what comes to mind when you hear the term unconscious bias? What does that mean for you? So we know that there are different types of biases. Yeah. Yep. Any other thoughts? Yeah, ideas that we have that we don't know we have, yep. Uh, predisposed to bias for some reason, yep. Thank you. So I guess when we think of unconscious bias, um, I've got one more in the chat box. Yeah, somebody said, just like the example that we've just had, um, could not relate to gender bias. Yeah, so sometimes we, I mean, not sometimes, we, we have different types of biases for different situations and different people. Um, and there's a range of biases that people have around gender, for example, there's biases around race, there's biases um, around different, different groups, um, and also biases around, um, I guess, different ideas, which will go on as well. All right, um, somebody shared a story that I'm gonna read out. After I had a surgery once, I was waiting for so long for the doctor to come and let me know how things had gone. Uh, nurses had been coming in and out for a couple of hours. A female doctor came in while I was on the phone to my sister and I said to my sister, yeah, I'm still just waiting for the doctor. And the woman said, actually, I'm the doctor. I was so upset and I hadn't realized a woman would be the doctor. She was wearing a different uniform to the nurses. That's a really good example. So, um, and thank you for sharing that because yes, you know, you, consciously we know that women, you know, she can be a doctor, but I did, I guess the deeply held assumptions that we might have where you were perhaps assuming that it was a nurse because at a subconscious level, you were ex not expecting her to show up as she did. Even consciously, you could see that she was dressed differently to the nurses. So 
that's a really good example. And I think um, it's, it's often not until we're confronted with these situations that our biases really come to light. Um, so I guess if we think of um, the notion of what is unconscious bias, um, so unlike conscious bias, unconscious bias, um, I guess it's a way of our, it's a way of our brain categorizing information in order to help us function more easily at a very basic level. And Liz is going to talk about the neuroscience behind it in a moment. But if you sort of think at a very basic level, we learn to navigate our environment by by learning how things work out of and, and we sort of do things out of assumption. So if if you were to make a decision right now that you are going to leave the webinar and go get a drink, for example, um, you would automatically do that without necessarily thinking about the steps involved. You're not going to think to yourself, I'm going to get up from my seat or from my whatever you're sitting from my chair. I'm going to move to the left, take, you know, eight and a half steps to my right in front of me, there'll be a door. I'll twist the doorknob, take, you know, five meter steps to my kitchen. I'll turn on the tap. You know, we, we don't, we don't break down our steps um, consciously. We just sort of act because we've learned to navigate our environment that way. So similarly, our biases form over time and it informs how we then think and behave without us necessarily being conscious that we're doing that. Um, so it's a mental conditioning. Um, I guess at a very basic level, it's important. It, it's necessary for human functioning. But what becomes dangerous in terms of unconscious bias is when we take the same sort of mental processes and apply them to situations and to people. And then we sort of act out of autopilot without realizing that we're doing or without realizing that we're thinking the way that we're thinking. And that then informs our behavior um, as well. So they are unconscious, they're deeply held ideas, and they sit just below the surface of our consciousness. So we're not aware that we even think um, that way. Unconscious bias is also as bias, we may have, may have heard this term as well. So as I've said, they're deeply held assumptions. Now, it's important to be aware, um, I guess, when, when you do have those triggering moments or when you have an opportunity to realize that maybe there are certain biases that you had, and that other example that one of the participants shared um, about waiting for the doctor who had showed up, but you know, making an assumption that it was a nurse, it's those opportunities that are really learning moments that we can really unpack what biases we have so that then we're not acting out of these mental shortcuts that allow us to make decisions that have, um, I guess, repercussions for the people around us without us realizing we're doing that. Biases are inherent in all of us. Um, they develop at an early age. They usually don't emerge until sort of middle childhood, but they also develop throughout um, child, uh, across the child, childhood, but also um, into adulthood there's bias that exists. There's many, many different types. Um, affinity bias, I think, is one that people would be familiar with. It's also sometimes known as like, likes, like. So when we have a preference or a tendency to navigate, sorry, gravitate towards people that are similar to ourselves. Now, that similarity could be based on, it could be based on uh, sort of, uh, I guess, it could be based on gender. It could be based on someone of the same ethnic background, or it could be based on other factors like um, parental status, for example. Um, and our brains have a way of sort of being able to pick and choose, I guess, in terms of affinity. So I'll, I'll give you another example of how, how it sort of can vary across context. So if I walked into a room um, and there was 20 people that were all strangers to me in the room, um, and 15 of them are men, but five of them are women. They may all be different cultural background to myself, for example, but if I gravitate towards the, the group of five women, I have an affinity there that's based on a similarity that I'm perceiving based on gender, right? In another situation, if I walk into a room with 20 strangers, two of whom are the same background or look like me, for example, um, and I 
gravitate towards the two people that look like me as opposed to the or the other people that don't look like me I've sort of um, my brain's taken me through a process where it's sort of picked and choose what is most um, sort of uh, I guess like me in that context so that could change so in one context it could be gender in another context it could be um, ethnic um, identity for example when we think of ageism um, and and I think this is one that is also uh, fairly obvious so discriminating against somebody based on ideas on the basis of age or the ideas that we um, attribute to different age groups. So treating um, younger people, for example, in a workplace situation uh, in, a, in a way that's paternalistic or in a way that assumes that they are not competent. Or it could also be the flip side where we treat an elderly person in a particular way as quite child, childlike or quite in need of being told what to do or what have you. Now it's gonna vary across different societies and different cultures as well, because the context of our biases also change based, based on our environment. Another one is attrib attribution bias. So for example, because some people see women um, as less than competent um, compared to men, uh, they may undervalue their achievements or their accomplishments and overvalue their mistakes. So zero in on, the, on what they perceive as negative um, and sort of disregarding what they see as positive. Uh, attribution bias is another one. So when we, um, oh, sorry, that's the one I just, yeah. Um, so beauty bias is another one. So ideas that are held based um, on people's outer appearance and research actually indicates that people that are perceived um, as better looking, um, do actually ex have different experiences in terms of being um, more likely to be judged uh, in a way that's quite favorable. So people that are attractive are generally um, treated more favorably um, in, in different contexts. Uh, if you think of confirmation bias, so looking for information that sort of or affirms or, or uh, pre-existing ideas that you might already have. So. I might, I might watch the news and I might see, or I might read you know, some articles and I might find one article that really focuses on or agrees with what I already believe and I zero in on that one piece of research, even though there's more research that indicates otherwise. If you think of conformity bias, I might just sort of uh, hand it back to participants. So what do you think conformity bias might be? Or what's an example of conformity bias that we might see in society? Anyone? Yep, so we've got, yep. So more likely to agree with the mainstream. It's an idea that you, um, someone said tendency to confirm, to conform to expectations, exactly. So if you think of sort of workplace situations, you're in a meeting and um, maybe the, the most senior person in the meeting says something that, you know, they say, this is how we think we need to run with this. And everybody agrees out of sort of a belief that that's what the majority thinks is okay or is correct, even though the majority might actually be thinking otherwise. So the tendency to conform to what uh, we might perceive as sort of the accepted expectations in a, in a particular situation. Thank you. Uh, if we think of gender bias, um, I think that's an obvious one, and we've had those uh, few examples as well, which really highlight um, the ideas that people have or the assumptions that are made around gender, be they you know related to employment or career or um, you know related to I guess different different ideas, whether it's around capacity, for example, um, or even around leadership. That's also a common one um, as well. The halo or horns effect, so the tendency to put someone on a pedestal or think more highly of that person, um, or on the flip side, perceiving someone more negatively um, after learning something unfavorable about them. Um, and name bias, a very common one when it comes to employment where assumptions are made based on a person's name and perceived background um, and and that has huge implications and, and i think a lot of that has led to things like 
um, blind uh, CVs and resumes because of the recognition of biases within sort of recruitment. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Liz and she's gonna explore the research side of it um, as well as the science um, side of it as well. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I'm going to kind of go into, like she said, um, the neurobiology or the neurocognitive sociology of bias, um, because I think it can be hard at times to really quantify how um, our unconscious biases play out every day in terms of our behaviors. Um, quite a number of studies have been conducted in the past, um, particularly over the last three decades, um, that really has improved our understanding of how our unconscious biases have evolved. Um, in some of our workshops, we have participants um, take an implicit association test put out by Harvard University. And that's one sort of um, assessment that people have used to kind of measure um, the unconscious biases that we have. Um, other studies um, have shown, for example, um, and this is all adapted from the University of California, uh, San Francisco, they put together kind of this, um, a bit of a mini literature review of what has been put out. But uh, DOOR 2014 um, did a study and really showed that unconscious biases do develop at an early age and they continue to emerge um, during middle childhood as well as um, towards, as we go towards adulthood. Um, unconscious biases do have real world effects on behavior that was proven by Das Gupta in 2014. And biases, unconscious biases are malleable. So we can take steps to minimize the impact of the biases that we have. We all have them, but as I had said earlier, we don't necessarily act on them. And we can, you know, just the mere fact of you attending today or, um, gaining knowledge and becoming more self-aware, you can um, mitigate those impacts. Uh, there has been research across fields, so showing how unconscious bias has affected various domains from the criminal justice system or education, healthcare. Um, I know we had a few examples earlier and um, that that's really common. Since, two, since 1997, there's been over 30 studies published um, that show that um, the effect of unconscious bias on clinical decision making for healthcare providers. Um, racial bias is very prevalent um, among providers. And, um, and for example, parodies in 2013 showed with their study that race does influence um, medical decision making. Um, another interesting study was um, uh, fictitious resumes. Uh, they had um, non-white participants create resumes with white sounding names and they sent them out to help wanted ads and they looked at kind of what who was receiving callbacks compared to the resumes of uh, and this was done in the US, African-American sounding names. Um, they, you know, Bertrand and Mulanahan in 2014 found that those white sounding resumes did receive a 50% um, more callbacks for interviews. So the biases that we have, they play out in real world situations and um, trying to bring to light what those unconscious biases are is, or these, the implicit biases that we have is really important. Um, on the next slide, um, if Liz is there, just, yeah. Uh, maybe the slide right before that, the limbic system. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I just want to talk really quickly, because I know we're getting close to our time, just about the hard science a little bit. So um, on the top of the brain, um, you have your cerebrum, and this is kind of your, um, pro your processing center, your, uh, the largest portion of your brain, and it involves all your higher functions. It's split up into um, multiple different portions, but I'd really like to highlight um, on the bottom left, which is your amygdala. Um, they have done studies that have looked at, um, if you want to go to the next slide, please, um, that this, it's, it's an almond size cluster of nerves of um, neurons and it's responsible for 
feeling certain emotions and perceiving emotions in others. And it also can oftentimes generate the distrust, um, distrust of things that pose dangers, such as predators or being lost somewhere. Um, and they have done actual brain imaging studies that have found increased signaling in the amygdala when people make those micro judgments like we had mentioned earlier, or um, in one study, the micro judgments of, of how trustworthy someone's face looks like. Um, so uh, it's, it's too, from that study, they, they found that it was too short of time, um, just a few milliseconds to really, you know, classify that kind of judgment as a conscious judgment. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last study I'd like to just highlight was one where they researchers tapped into negative um, black stereotypes by playing rap or hip hop music for white participants who they had already screened out or primed for no extrinsic, extrinsic or conscious biases. So they had kind of um, screened those participants out and they found still um, when they measured the amygdala activation that they they did still inherently have those implicit biases. So ultimately what, you know, we're just very lightly skimming the surface, but the importance of understanding kind of our biology and the fact that there are studies out there that really um, highlight the effect of our unconscious biases is that um, although research is ongoing, uh, how our amygdala, for example, responds to responds as people Accept, uh, assess the relative importance of differences is really nuanced and complex, um, but we need to recognize its importance and continue to do research. Thank and you, Liz. Liz. Thank you. All right. All right, so I guess we've sort of covered very lightly um, at a very basic level, um, how it is that bias forms um, and some of the mental processes involved that lead us to sort of have these deeply held um, ideas and assumptions that then subsequently impact on our thought patterns, on our perceptions, on our attitudes towards others, and also how we might um, then behave towards people that we might perceive as different or similar to ourselves. So sort of most of us, um, I think most people would um, assume that, you know, that they are fair, that they're ethical, that they're um, unbiased in terms of how they think, but also behave towards others. The reality is, um, as we've sort of explored earlier, we all have biases. Um, and these preconceived ideas, because they're so deeply held, they influence um, our perception at a very deep level. So in terms of how we might perceive the world around us, how we might perceive people, and what we might perceive as reality is very much influenced by those deeply held um, assumptions. The attitudes that we may develop over time, um, how we react towards certain people is also influenced by that. Um, how receptive or friendly we are towards certain people in terms of our behaviors is also influenced by these biases. In terms of um, attention, I guess, which aspects of a person we pay most attention to? Uh, the mere fact that there's certain aspects um, of certain individuals that we pay more attention than others um, also lends itself to these deeply held um, assumptions that we hold. In terms of our listening skills, so how much do we actively listen to certain people um, is also influenced by biases. So we know um, if, if we sort of look at, um, I guess, in, in a very general sense, um, employment and certain I different ideas around different careers. Uh, people, it's been proven research as well that people are more likely to listen to somebody with the title of a doctor um, than they are because of assumptions made about the level of knowledge, of their competence, etc. So what we pay attention to and what we listen, uh, or, or what aspects of a person we pay most attention to are also influenced by the preconceived ideas that we have been conditioned to hold over time. And also, um, lastly, I might microaggressions. So how much or how little do we comfort people in certain situations? Uh, it's, it's a fact that we're more likely to comfort certain people than others. So 
uh, if we were to use sort of, um, I guess, gender as an example, um, and if I, and I'll use, I'll use my two kids as an example. I've got a four-year-old girl and a seven-year-old boy. And if I was, if I was to be more comforting towards my daughter when she falls over, but I'm more likely to say to my son, oh, oh you'll be fine. Just, you know, you'll, you'll be fine. That also lends itself to assumptions that I might have around gender because I, you know, being raised uh, in a world old what that says you know like you know we we hear a lot all the time around uh and not that i do this by the way um, <laughs> i'm consciously parenting i hope um but i think it's it's a reality that we form different ideas around gender and so that influences our micro affirmation so am i more likely to comfort my daughter and less likely to do that to my son also lends itself to those biases as well and i think if we sort of look um at a more at a more broader level, uh, um, there's a lot of conversation at the moment um, around things like toxic masculinity. And there's a lot of talk about the fact that it, a lot of that also is related to these ideas that people are raised in contexts that say, boys don't cry, toughen up, you'll be fine. So some of those ideas um, that sort of simmer, I guess, unconscious influence on how we might behave around gender or around the ideas that we raise in concerning gender as well. And of addressing unconscious bias, we have a minute left, but we are, this is sort of a second last slide. Um, so in terms of addressing unconscious bias, firstly, it's about being aware that bias actually exists. You can't address something if you don't acknowledge its existence, right? So that's one. I've just got someone here in the chat box. Okay, someone said they have to leave. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks for participating. We have to be able to firstly acknowledge that it exists. We have to be able to challenge ourselves um, and shine a flashlight on our biases. So it's not until we have those triggering moments and someone shared earlier their, their experience being in hospital and the doctors rocked up, but they're on the phone saying, I'm still waiting for the doctor because they assumed uh, because it was a female doctor ma making an assumption that um, it was a nurse. So when we have those, um, I guess, triggering moments well, that we use them as learning moments and rather than suppressing the ideas that sort of come to light, it's about how do we understand and redirect those beliefs. So when you come into conscious awareness that you have certain thoughts around gender, it's about then reflecting to say, okay, why is it, do, why do I think that way in this particular situation or concerning this particular person, when at a conscious level, that's not congruent with my conscious beliefs. Um, because that's the other thing as well. Our unconscious beliefs are often um, sort of not in line with our conscious beliefs. So we might have a conscious belief um, that, you know, we, women can be doctors, but uh, you know, at an unconscious level, that might be a different story. So rather than suppressing them, it's about redirecting and sort of unpacking where that comes from. It's also about being able to sit with the discomfort or the awkwardness and asking yourself, what's triggering you to feel this way? Also finding opportunities for positive exposure because the reality is we are bombarded with information and imagery that often conditions us to continue to think a certain way. And if that means sort of seeking out alternative media, if that means exposing yourself to um, other groups or other ways of being and other ways of seeing the world, um, etc. that positive exposure starts to impact us over time. How do we reflect on our thoughts and our beliefs? Do we consciously take time to actually reflect, why do I think this way? Where does this come from? Um, how can I, you know, make an impact or make a change around this belief system? And then moving into reflecting on our actions. Because uh, ultimately what we want is we want to be able to redirect our conscious thoughts to become our subconscious way of thinking so that then we act out of um, or we might behave in, in ways that is more in line with our conscious beliefs. And all right. 